Good day, I'm Father Tom from the Holy Rosary in Winthrop. Do you realize that I've been there since 1995? My Lord, 1995, I arrived at the Holy Rosary. I'll never forget it. Those red doors, those red doors. When I got to the Holy Rosary, the first thing I did was to go to the church, and those red doors were locked. And I said to myself, Self, no more. We will not lock the doors of the church because our Lord is here and he is present for us and people will come to pray. And you know what? I'm not saying we have many people, but every once in a while I go in and you see there's somebody with the Lord, somebody on their knees, someone making a visit, someone with their heads bowed, someone in the presence of God. Well, 1995, September 11th, 1995. You know, let me see how old I was. 61, 51, 48. When I came here, I was a young pup. 48. And my question is, where has the time gone? I think we are in an acceleration of time. Time goes by so quickly. Like I wake up in the morning and I say, you know what, what day is it? It's Sunday. And I wake up again and I say, what day is it? It's Sunday again. How could seven days have passed so quickly? People say, Father Tom, that's because you're getting old. Yeah, I am getting old. So aren't you. But I'm thinking it's not because I'm getting old. I'm thinking that time is accelerating and we need to use every single minute and we need to make sure that all that we use in time counts. I do not want to fool around. Now, I'm not saying not to have fun. That's not what I'm saying. I go to a medical doctor and he says to me, are you having any fun? And I said, you know, I, I, I do have fun. He says, do you feel guilty? I said, no, I'm not Irish. When I have fun, I don't have to feel guilty because I'm not Irish. He's Irish, and he starts smiling. He says, I feel guilty when I have fun. I said, that's too bad. That's too bad. When I have fun, I don't feel guilty. I don't. You know, the point is, I said, my problem is, you know, the time making time to have fun and with the people, making time and having the people at the same time. That's my problem. But when I have fun, I don't feel guilty. Like I went and spoke uh, someplace recently and there was a pool and I said, you know what? I'm getting in this pool. You know why? I don't ever get in a pool. So, you know, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. Did you feel guilty? Oh, no, I don't feel guilty when I'm having fun. Because you know what? Everybody needs to do that. But I'm telling you, when we work, we work. When we do what we do, need to do, we do. Like today, we came here today, and uh, we've been having services 20 days in a row. This is our 20th night services, Worship, worshiping God praying for healing. We've seen some wonderful healings. We saw a woman with the whole body cast who came in last Thursday. She couldn't move her neck. She was in a whole body cast, honest. And we started to pray with her. She left without the body cast, completely. She left without the body cast, completely. The power of God hit her. My Lord, that's wonderful. Saw a man, saw, you know, uh, many men whose shoulders were healed, you know, the, these rotary cuff things. Well, you know what? I should write into the insurance company and say, you know, I want a rebate. These people aren't going to have operations now. Send me a rebate. Give me 1% of what it would have cost. Of course, I wouldn't do that. I'm only kidding. I remember years ago being in Florida, and even when I go on vacation to Florida, they schedule me to pray for people. 
There was a woman who had been really bothered for years with a rotary cuff problem. Every time I see her, it's only once a year, my Lord, she waves her arm and says, no operation, I'm still healed. That's wonderful. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. That's what God knows how to do. The last place I was at, you know, there was a woman, and she had chronic pain in her stomach. So after I prayed with her, she said, you know, it's chronic. And I said, you know, that's just an excuse. God wants to heal you. Then she said, you know, it's cancer. And I said, oh, we'll spend some extra time praying for you. And so we began to pray with this woman. After we prayed with this woman, she looked and smiled and said, that's a miracle. I have no pain. I don't know if the cancer is gone, but I know she has no pain. And she said, that's a miracle. You see, this is what God knows how to do. But he needs a vessel to work through, or vessels to work through. That's what he needs. So let me tell you, at the Holy Rosary, we run a school. I don't think it's a school. I, I'd more like to call it a, a prophetic school. Why? Father Matthew came. He's from Nigeria. Father Raymond was here three months, Poland. Just left today. Father Martin came from Poland, just came yesterday. He's staying for the month. Father Vitek has been with us, will be with us for 40 days from Poland. Father Joshi is coming back after his two-month vacation from India. One comes, another one goes. But let me tell you, they don't only come. They come, and the Spirit of God begins to touch them so that they can do the same things and pray for the people, because I want to tell you, people want to be prayed with. That's all. You don't have to heal people. You only have to pray with them. It's God's. God heals people. I don't heal people. God heals people. But you know what? We give the Lord the opportunity as we pray. You see, that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. But that's not all. Father Wojtek is coming, ordained a priest a year. He spent his first three months with me as an ordained priest, coming back for another two months. Father Adam is coming from the Holy Land. So we have a prophetic school. A prophetic school. And then we have Father Ilric from Haiti, in and out. I want to tell you, this is, you know, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I could never do anything like this. I don't have a sign on my door say, come, this is my house, and you know what? I want to spread the power of God to you. I don't know how people find out, but they find out. And you know what? I told you I've been at the Holy Rosary since 1995. In 1996, the Lord said to me, I am going to send people to you from all around the world. When I heard that, I said, this is so foolish. This is so far-fetched. How would people come to this out-of-the-way little parish to, to see me all around the world. But you know what? I have to repent because I said God's word was foolish. But it sounded foolish. How would people from all around the world find out about me? Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And so these things continue to happen. These things continue to happen, and it's totally beyond my ability. That's why I say it is so important that you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Things will happen that you could never, ever in a thousand years cause to happen as you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Things will happen that you could never imagine as you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is real stuff. And you know what? We always have a bed. Let me tell you what happened last week. Because this is kind of funny. I came home from a service and I went into my room. And there is Father Ilrich sleeping in my bed. And I'm thinking, someone's sleeping in my bed. Remember? Remember the three little bears? Someone's sleeping in my... And I'm... I'm this is now like it's 11.30, whatever. And I'm thinking, this is funny. Someone sleeping in my bed. I thought he was coming the next day. And I told him that he could have my bed. And you know what? There was still an available bed. But you see, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what it's all about? So I went in the end room. Bed wasn't made. Because we're waiting for the next person to come. Father, Father Joshi's coming back. Went to the end room. Bed wasn't made. And I just got the pillows, covered myself, and fell fast asleep. Smiling. Someone sleeping in my bed. I don't understand how these things happen, but I do understand that they do happen when we're open. And you know, when I think about it, you know, all these priests that are coming, they're all young men. And look at me, you know, I'm no longer young. I don't consider myself old. I have a young spirit. I don't really consider myself old. But why me? It's not that I'm a paradigm and I've got all these things and you know I, I have Mercedes Benz and I don't have any of that stuff. But God sends people so that they can love and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he does it. I know that's true. And it makes me happy to know that the Lord is accomplishing his will through me. Makes me happy. Now, I want to tell you about one of the things that I hear quite often, because I am involved with pro-life work. Before I tell you some stories, I want to tell you what happened on Thursday morning. Thursday morning, my friend Eleanor went out to the abortion mill. Now, I didn't go Thursday. I was asked on Thursday to go to court with someone from Winthrop. So I blocked out my day to spend hours in court. I'll tell you the whole story. So anyway, Thursday morning, my friend Eleanor went to the abortion mill, Planned Parenthood. And Father Matthew, who's from Nigeria, thought that when he left at 8.30, he was going to court. I don't know why he thought that. He heard me talking about court. So he got in the car thinking he's going to court. I don't know how he's going to court without me because I was going to court. They met Joan and John. That's right. Eddie and his wife, Sandy, Mary, a couple of others that were there praying. And there was a one turnaround. One woman decided to have the baby. And Eleanor took her number and, you know, she calls Eleanor now. But there was another one that was very doubtful. They had spent hours with this lady. And Eleanor gave her, the lady, the card with her name on it. So, you know, we want to help you. Today, Eleanor got a call from the woman. She said, I didn't have the abortion. But you know what? This is all on her, her answering machine. The father of the baby got on the phone and said, I want to thank you for saving my baby's life. And I want to thank you for saving my life because 
I love you. My Lord. My Lord. My Lord. The Lord used me to get Eleanor involved with this. Do you realize Eleanor has saved over a hundred children? Do you realize how many people Eleanor and her husband helped because they have means? How many rents they paid? You would never believe. How many automobiles they fixed? Because you're talking about poor people. How many times people with twins have come to their home? Well, what I want to say is that people will look at me and say, you know, you're a one-issue person. You only care about the unborn. That's not true. You see, if you love Jesus, you care more than that about the unborn. But you see, they are the most defenseless. And the woman is even more defenseless. There was a woman who went in there the other day. Oh, they talked with her and talked with her and talked with her and prayed with her. And she says, I've got to have the abortion. She went in, had the abortion. She comes out weeping. They take her in, the, in their arms. Because the people in the abortion mill, they could kill us. They now have their $800. So they take her in their arms and say, you know, we, you need to talk to us or we can get you help to talk to people. But you see, the big, the big lie about this is that people say it's a woman's choice. See, it's the devil's choice to kill. It's the devil's choice to kill. And while that woman went into that abortion mill, she thought, this will be my easy answer. Nobody has to know. And while she walks out of that abortion mill, the devil tells her, you killed your child. She knows instinctively that's what she's done. And then the sorrow that she must bear for the rest of her life. You have no idea. Or maybe you do. Maybe you bear that sorrow. Let me tell you that Jesus wants to heal you. I was in the office the other day with people. It was not confession. And there was a man and a woman there. And the woman said, you know, I've had an abortion. I said, honey. She said, I carry the pain. I said, I can help you with that. First of all, I want you to start thinking, praying, was it a boy or a girl? Then we're going to name the baby. Then we're going to have a mass said for the baby. People say, you know, you're only involved with one thing. That's not true. You know what today is? Today's Friday. Friday, Everything begins at the Holy Rosary again. It's like a menagerie. On Friday, people come with tins of chicken, chicken legs, that we buy for the people out in the street. They bake them. Now they'll start coming. A hundred pounds of chicken will be delivered to us that's cooked, ready to be given to people out in the street tomorrow. Then tonight, somebody will come with bread, leftover bread from one of the stores. We'll have bread that's up to the ceiling in our porch. Honest. Bread up to the ceiling in our porch. Then someone else will come with bread from Panera. That's tonight. Tomorrow, at about 7 o'clock, the rectory doors will start opening. And the women and the men will be there, and they'll be making tuna fish salad. You know, these big commercial cans, three of them, with mayonnaise and, 
and celery and whatever else they put in it. Then Dorothy will be boiling hot dogs and then frying them, putting them in hot dog rolls. Then someone else has made hard boiled eggs and the mayonnaise will go in the hard boiled eggs. And then the desserts that we've got will go into plastic bags. Then the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, that's for the poor people out in the street, for something to eat in the afternoon. What we're doing is not a great thing, I'm going to tell you, because it's just a, it's a human thing. It's a, a loving thing. It's a Christian thing. Do you realize there are like 300 people that we serve as out in the street? The 300 people that are out in the street, and you're talking about children, you're talking about men and women, boys and girls. You're talking about people that are living outdoors. It's sad. But we don't only feed them. Our people go out and pray with them, listen to them, talk to them by name. You're only involved in one issue. I don't think so. Do you realize in the last eight weeks I've had six people who came to me that were heroin addicted? They hear about somebody who prays, somebody that might be able to help them, and they come. I've never dealt with so many people that are heroin addicted. And you want to know what they tell me? How, why did you start? Because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to fit in. I tell them, you know, the devil wants you dead. And they tell me all my friends are dead with overdoses. You see, we cannot fix people, but we can pray with them. We can love them. We can care for them. We really can. And you don't have to have answers. You know, you just have to have a heart that stretches out. That's all you need is a heart that stretches out. Without a heart that stretches out, we can't help anybody. Many years ago, we had someone living in the church. They stayed there for a long time. Now they have their own house. They were even baking cookies. We weren't supposed to have anybody in the church, but you know what? I cannot see people out in the street when I've got a bed. And the very people who tell us we're not supposed to have people in the church will be saying, at Christmas, that Jesus was rejected by the innkeeper. I'm the innkeeper. You see, what I do is not ex extraordinary. It's kind. It's, it's human. Jesus calls us to love people. Remember I said that I had to go to, I had to, go to, a, to court the other day? That's another story. I went to court. I could only stay an hour and a half. I never even saw the person that was I was supposed to see because I had to be someplace else. But I knew that this person was going to get a break, even though the judge sent everybody else up the river. Honest to Pete, I knew the person was going to get a break. I knew it. He's a good person. Just has a problem. But you know what? I had to leave. I said to the family, I have to leave. I'm sorry, but I will pray. When I went outside, first of all, I went outside, and there was a, a man and a woman who walked up to me and said, where's the church? I said, I have no idea where the church is. I don't live here. The woman said, I just came home from Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I have a tumor in my uterus. I have bad kidneys. Do you have money? I need $10 to get back to Rhode Island. So I opened my wallet. I had no money. You know why? When I was on the plane, I left my wallet on the seat and all my money was stolen. It was like about $280, $250. So I couldn't give them money. I said, but you know what? Someone's going to pick me up 
and I'll have the $10 for you. They'll give me $10 for you. I started to pray with these two people. The power of God came upon them. The man saw my crucifix and said, I love that crucifix. I took it off and gave it to him. He said, I can't take that. I said, oh, yes, you can, because I've got others. I said, that's the way Jesus loves you, even unto death. They said, we never met anybody that would pray with us like this. And the guy said, I never experienced so much of God's presence. This is in the middle of Suffolk Superior Court on the street. Was that extraordinary? No. It was just someone caring for some misfortunate person. I gave them my telephone number. I gave them my name. I said, I really want to know how you're doing. We will call you. You don't have to do a lot, but you have to do it with love, and you have to do it for Jesus and in Jesus' name. That's all you have to do. And it doesn't have to be big. God takes the little things and multiplies them. The Lord takes the crumbs of bread and feeds the crowds. I'm asking you to do what only a Christian would do. Ask the Lord, send me one person, but you send them. And may the Lord bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God bless you.